With us today, we have Dr. Louise de Saussure, Professor of Linguistics and Discourse Analysis at the University of Neuchâtel in Switzerland, who specializes in, among other things, argumentation and persuasion and discourse. And is going to talk to us today about straw men. Dr. de Saussure, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Okay, let's uh, start right out with fallacies. You write a lot about the role of fallacies and arguments, and you say that even fallacies that may fail to persuade an audience can still constitute a winning move. Can you explain how that works? It, it's a very complex issue, but uh, let me try to make it simple. Uh, classical rhetoric classifies uh, you know, sound and unsound arguments according to formal logic. Um, but in reality, many arguments that would fall into the category of fallacies are perfectly sound in natural everyday interaction. For example, the fallacy called uh, ad populum or bandwagon fallacy, where some assumption is assumed true for the reason that it is believed true by a great number of people, is perfectly reasonable in many everyday interactions because it enables us to, so to say, capitalize on the knowledge and experience of, of many. Um, whether it is or not, a reasonable move entirely depends on contextual elements, what we are talking about, etc. And the same holds with the argument of authority, for example. So this tendency of making the most of contextual, contextual indicators is a major drive of our way of constructing beliefs. Um, unfortunately, when it comes to persuasion and propaganda, this tendency opens to cognitive flaws, and we are quite easily trapped by this instinct that works so well in normal collaborative interactions. Now, when it comes to the Stroman fallacy in particular, which, which consists in misrepresenting uh, the position of, an, of the interlocutor, we observe this extraordinary phenomenon that even when the fallacy becomes obvious to the audience, uh, its author may still capitalize on it. This happens for the reason that making a successful strawman fallacy requires a form of intellectual agility, um, aptitude, ability, which is recognized by the audience who gives credit to its author regardless of the unfairness of the misrepresentation. So instinctively, the people in the audience are aware that the original speaker should have predicted the possibility of his behavior or speech being misinterpreted and, and should therefore have done something to prevent the strawman to occur or simply should have behaved differently to avoid such a risk. The original speaker therefore appears as having failed in her interactional skills, if you want, while the author of the straw man appears as a brilliant interlocutor. So the audience may then recognize and appreciate the skills. And this becomes a stronger asset in the debate than what concerns truth itself. I would be keen to relate this to something very primitive in our, in our uh, human nature in our human way of granting power to individuals over, over, over others, right? In the extreme case, it might be that um, the, auth the author of such a successful straw man appears as something like an alpha male in animal societies, you know. This has to do with skills and strength, not so much with uh, being right or wrong, uh, morals, truthfulness, things like that. It's based upon very primitive reactions that we all have deep inside us and makes humans admire the powerful, the strong, the skilled, however malevolent or manipulative it might be. So let's start out with our definition of a straw man. So yeah. here at PropWatch, we define a straw man as a technique where you distort an opponent's argument to make it easier to attack. That's exactly that, correct. And as you were saying uh, in, in your research, you actually consider that the minor effect of a straw man with the major effect being what you call gaining prestige or social victory. Yeah, if we start with the beginning, though, so the straw man fallacy consists in misrepresenting the thoughts of an individual, right? 
Um, this can, of course, happen by mistake in everyday conversation. It, it does happen quite often, and this is not an issue. Uh, it's just about misunderstandings, and we, get, we can correct this in the normal flow of benevolent cooperative conversation. But as, as soon as uh, it happens with a delusive, persuasive intention, that is knowingly, uh, in order to distort the position of the opponent and win an argument and, and gain a better position in debate, strawmen are, you know, uh, have this very special impact and very strong consequences. It, it, mount, it amounts to a manipulative attack on the credibility of the individual who is targeted. Um, in such cases, the straw man fallacy uh, is in fact a way to gain credit in front of a third party, an external audience who's watching the debate and who's expected to take position. For example, in one of the presidential debates opposing uh, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton at the time, she was uh, talking about having open borders with Mexico in the domain of electricity and energy trade, I remember. And Trump attacked her and said, she wants open borders, implying that Clinton actually wants open borders at large, you know, in all respects. That is also with regard to this sensitive topic, which is immigration. So obviously in such a case, we certainly can't assume that Trump was speaking in good faith. That was clearly a manipulative attempt in which Clinton was portrayed in a specific way as thinking something unacceptable, unacceptable for at, at least for a great part of the debate's audience. So misrepresenting uh, Clinton's intentions was this a tool for persuading the part of the audience that was still undecided, or agnostic or to move towards supporting Trump. So we can see the effect of such uh, uh, straw men in this kind of, of cases. Uh, yeah, you say the author of a straw man is making a correct interpretation of the speaker's utterance, but you know, it's the speaker, um, not the author of the straw man that finds themselves with the burden of proving that the interpretation is incorrect. Um, yeah. Could you explain this phenomenon? Of course, indeed. What happens is actually, uh, that the straw man is based on implicit indicators. There's something in the context that makes it appear as a plausible representation of something. Uh, and in a debate, uh, a plausible representation of something in the mind of the opponent that uh, the opponent left unsaid. So for the audience, there's a this natural tendency to try and figure out why these thoughts were not openly displayed by the opponent. So the answer appears uh, quite obvious, of course. These, these thoughts, these intentions uh, are, for example, in the case of Trump uh, versus Clinton, simply unavoidable, either because they're ridiculous for some reason or because they're scandalous with respect to some moral norm or because making them clear would be obviously unacceptable for most people. So in that, in that Trump-Clinton case, having open borders at large is of course unacceptable or even crazy in the opinion of, of the part of the audience that Trump is interested in persuading. And, and mentioning this is likely to fuel some paranoid notion that Trump is truly uncovering a hidden project when he strawmans her. Um, right, so and he's uh, exposing the real meaning. Exactly, yeah. exposing the real intentions. Um, the, the, the strawman makes it look like as if the target did not, the victim of the strawman, the opponent, did, did not fully disclose her thoughts because at some point that, that person who is the interlocutor was realizing that they're not acceptable, but too late to hide them completely or something, leaving some elements you know, uh, available to speculate that. So this leaves the floor open to all sorts of speculations, even paranoid ones, about a sort of a malevolent intention on the part of the victim of the straw man to hide critical things. So, and, and of course, this makes the author of the Strowman appear as a sort of savior who's clever enough to uncover what the original speaker really? was trying to hide. And of course, 
there is this notion that you can't prove what you think, what you don't think. There is no evidence that you can present objectively about what's the content of your heads, right? So reacting to this accusation is complicated. Um, the second reason is that the successful straw man is, is based on indicators that are provided by the victim of the straw man himself or herself. Clinton actually said open borders in her original speech, literally leaving the compliment about energy deals implicit because it was clear in the context of that time, at that moment. So that was certainly a mistake on her part. Leaving something implicit makes it possible for the opponent to complete what you say with whatever pleases him. In other cases, what the speaker says leads to plausible implicit conclusions, even though fallacious. And verbal, verbalizing such fallacious implicit conclusions are powerful uh, straw men because it looks as if the original speaker was not okay to say openly the full contents of our thoughts, as I said before. So uh, this puts the victim of the straw man in a very difficult position. And what is more, uh, we count real contributions to a discussion as more relevant as a principle than justifications. When you look at this from a cognitive viewpoint on language and communication, it's easy to see that justifications don't bring a new point, a new element in the discussion. Making justifications about who said what and who meant what are kinds of subroutines in the interaction freezing for a moment the actual discussion. Uh, the current topic of interaction is suspended, if you want, in order to do something much less interesting, much less relevant, which is discussing justification about, you know, who said what and who meant what, which is not provable, even more. Um, and in surplus, these uh, delusive straw men are constructed on things that are never completely explicit. Sometimes there is simply no way of making successful justifications. We can actually never prove what we did not mean something or imply something or think, or think something. And it's particularly slippery when it comes to sensitive notions that seem to be uncovered by the author of the straw man for the better good of the public. Thank you. That was a really thorough and um, illuminative uh, interview. Dr. De Sassour, thanks so much for spending time with us today. Thank you very much for inviting me. It was a pleasure.